In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today, we actually are going to be getting back to our series in the book of 1 Samuel. And the important thing to know, and I'm going to refresh your memory because I know it's been a few days since we were in this series. This is Samuel addressing Israel. He knows that he's at the very end of his life. He knows that he is not going to last much longer. And so this is kind of Samuel signing off his final message to Israel before he dies. And at this point, keep in mind, he has already anointed Saul as king. He's actually already anointed David king, even though Saul doesn't know that. He's not privy to that, at least not yet. And so Samuel's work is pretty much drawing to a close at this point. And so this is one of his final acts as the, in fact, I believe it is the final act, the final miracle that is uh, talked about in the Bible. So this is 1 Samuel 12, 16 through 18, where he says, Even now take your stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call the Lord, I will call to the Lord, that he may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great with you, uh, which you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. This is a really, the thing that is, I think, really a, a sticking out point of this story, something that really just sort of leaps off the page at you, is that the king has already been anointed. Saul is already on the throne, and God has actually already chosen king number two who's waiting in the wings. And so even though God sanctioned it and ordained it and allowed it to take place, he wants to remind Israel that this was their idea not his. That this was a plan cropped up by men, not God. Now, God was the one that did the selecting of the king, and God was the one that tried to, to make sure that he was an integral part of that process. But ultimately, it's important for us to remember that that is not what God wanted. He says that when they originally ask for a king, he says that when he finally capitulates and allows them to have a king, and he says it right here. God's plan was always for Israel to see himself as a king. His plan was always for Israel to be more or less self-governing and self-regulating and look to God as their ultimate sovereign and master. And Israel, because they couldn't stand being different, they couldn't stand being the only kid in town that didn't have a king to guide them, they demanded that God give them a king, and finally he relented and said, okay, but trust me, you're not going to like it. And, and Samuel just got done basically rehashing that, and now he's even giving a sign. On the day of the wheat harvest, which is one of the busiest days of the year in an agrarian society, the day that they're supposed to go out and, and gather all of the food that is going to sustain them through the winter, God causes a big calamity to hit them. And basically, he's saying, this is a reminder that you did sin, that you did wrong in asking for a king. I find that really fascinating because this is, I don't know exactly the amount of time, but this is a considerable amount of time after Saul has been anointed and also after God intervened to make sure that Saul had some credibility and was made king over the entire kingdom. And so, God has even played a part not only in picking and selecting a king, but also in solidifying Saul's rule and authority over all of Israel. And yet he's still saying, I just want to remind you that the king was not my idea. That's on y'all. And I want to remind you that this sin that took place, I just want to make it abundantly clear for all future generations to remember this was not my plan. And when your children and grandchildren look back and see, and by the way, of course, God looking into the future knew this, 
that you look all throughout Israel's history and the vast majority of kings were evil, wicked idolaters that caused Israel to sin. They're going to remember that it was your generation that started all of this. Just because I'm allowing for this to happen doesn't mean I approved it. We actually see this play out quite eloquently in the New Testament when the Pharisees and the rulers and lawyers and people who really knew the law of Moses ask Jesus Christ, they said, so why is it if it's wrong to divorce your wife for any reason? Why is it then that Moses said you just have to write a certificate of divorce? And do you remember what Jesus' answer was there? He said, because of the hardness of your hearts. So in other words, God allowed for a institution to take place even though it was not his ideal. He allowed it to take place because he knew that the hearts of men were evil and wicked, and just like there were going to be a whole bunch of people that wanted to divorce their wives, even though God hates that and does not want them to engage in it, he knew that Israel was going to get a king one way or the other, and so he allowed for that institution to take place, even though that wasn't what God wanted himself. It was not part of God's ideal, but because of man's wickedness, he made an accommodation for them. And so God is just making it abundantly clear here, just so everyone remembers from here to the end of time, this wasn't my plan. And so I think that it's, it's interesting and actually almost a little bit humorous that God does this to make sure that they remember that he did not sanction that. He's not the one that wanted that. But I think that there is a secondary reason that God chooses to do this and, and bring a storm in this way. And it shows, it talks about how much they feared Samuel and feared more specifically God for doing this and, and for what he has done with the thunder and the storms and everything that comes down upon them. I think that one thing that God was also trying to illustrate and, and the message that he was trying to convey to his people is, can your king do that? So Saul, who is, of course, the person that I appointed, and he's a mighty man of war, and he's been able to lead Israel's troops into battle and protect you. Yeah, can he do that? Can he make a storm? Can he wipe out a wheat crop if he wants to? Can he bring down divine punishment and judgment and see all sides? Is he all-knowing? Did he create the universe? No, okay, then maybe you should be listening to me instead of your king when your king tells you to go out and worship other gods. So yes, I do think that in part, at least part of this was God looking back and reminding them and punishing them for the sin of asking for a king, but I think a lot of it was also God looking forward to. Giving them a very visual, very obvious reminder that I'm actually in charge. Your king is just a steward that I have allowed to take power and authority that I sanctioned him to have. It comes from me. And for the Israelites that remembered that lesson, they were going to be the ones that weren't led astray by evil kings that had evil intentions in their heart. And I think that's a lesson that is 100% relevant to us today. You know, we as Christians complain a lot, and I, I think sometimes it's justified, sometimes we're being a little melodramatic, just like they were in Bible times, about what's going on with our country and our government and we remember that the world, as Jesus predicted, is always going to hate the righteous. No matter what form it takes, governments are always going to oppose us, whether it's our own government or a foreign government. There's always going to be an aspect of the world that sees us as people that they can't get along with. And there are legitimate reasons to call out for our religious liberty being inhibited, especially in the past few months. But ultimately, the message there is, remember, I'm your king, they're not. I'm the one that's actually in charge, they're not. Can they make a thunderstorm? Can they bring down judgment on people? No, then maybe you should be listening to me instead of them. That's the message. It's a message that he was bringing to Israel and remembering that it doesn't matter how bad your government is. It doesn't matter who's in charge. It doesn't matter how powerful they are or how much they curtail your religious liberty or your other rights. Ultimately, God is the one that is in control. And that's a message that is 100% as, re as relevant to us today as it was to Israel right then. Stay the course, friends. <laughs>
Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.